And um, we're going to talk about cremation a little bit. And um, I'm going to go probably give you a lot more information than you might have wanted. But I want to make sure we cover all the details on cremation because a lot of people don't know exactly what takes place with cremation and service options and everything else. Um, in, your, in your folder, you've got a bunch of handouts. So as we follow along, there's some things in there, that the brochures, that will be a lot of topics we're covering. Um, and also on this sheet here, the one that was sitting out separately, there's seminar notes, so if you want to take notes along the way, you can kind of jot on there. Um, but a lot of the information that you're going to hear from me today is covered in all the stuff that's in your handouts. Um, some of the stories we'll share with you, obviously, are in there, but um, to kind of support uh, some of the concepts and things we're doing. So my name is David Parado, one of the funeral directors and owners of the funeral home. I've uh, been licensed as a funeral director for 23 years. It goes by quick. Uh, past board member of the Rochester Funeral Directors and New York State Funeral Directors. Current uh, trustee for pre-plan. I'm actually supposed to be at, uh, at Albany today for a meeting, but I couldn't make it, so I had to be with you, which is fine. I told him, sorry, you guys are more important. So. <laughs> they forgive me. Um, currently on the Greece uh, Chamber of Commerce. And, uh, do a lot of volunteering in the community over the years because the community is such a, it's a great, it's a great, I just love living here and, and I love the people and it's such a great place to be a part of. So, cremation. Um, a lot of this stuff is once, once again, kind of rudiment, rudimentary, but you may not know some of this stuff. You know, how is someone cremated? 14 to 1800 degrees, it's quite warm. Uh, um, that heat reduces your body to its, to its natural elements, which are just, you know, bone fragments, uh, which a lot of people hear ash, and you know, you think that you're reduced to ashes, but you're really bone when you're, when you're done with the cremation. Um, it's in a chamber called a retort, um, so that machine might be, you know, as, as wide and as big as a screen and deep um, when you go to the, to the uh, crematorium. Um, one of the forms we fill out, the chamber is preheated, so what they do is they have paperwork, they ask us to to calculate what's the weight of the person. So they can then put these variables in a computer. It's very computerized. Uh, so they can set the, the, the parameters for that cremation so that it's done for the right amount of time so that you have a, a complete um, reduction into bone fragments. So they kind of sweep it. So now you've always heard these things about, do I get my ashes back? Am I commingled with the last person? These machines are very good. Uh, they have a great system to kind of really clean out from person to person so you're not mixing up people. Um, so there's a tray, so they kind of sweep it into this opening. You, you, you would see it at the, by the door. It drops in, and they can remove that whole tray so that they got just this person and not the last person and the next person. So it's not as, you know, it's not as rudimentary as it was 20 years ago when they may not have been as good at this. Um, so today, it's, it's a great system, and it, it does a be your peace of mind. Um, pacemaker. So one of the things we have to, when we sit with families, we have to ask, does someone have a pacemaker? The reason why it's important, those battery packs are explosive. So if we don't remove those, um, it could be harmful to the crematory operator. Um, so those have to be removed so they don't explode during the process. Um, the other thing is, today, some cancers require radioactive seeds and things like that to treat cancers. If those are in someone's body, those have to be removed also because that could be done discharged and once again the operators in that area in that space could be exposed to radioactivity so so some of these things really have to be discussed ahead of time and make sure we're not um, harming them so that, that's that's their their lives as well to be worried about um so there's a cremulator that takes bone fragments which are less and then that's when you would hear ash because it takes the bones and kind of reduces it down to a smaller size and that's what a misconception of you know ash versus bone is but it really is just bone um, Three to seven pounds. Um, it's probably about a nine inch high container by five inch by five by six inch container uh, that would house your remains uh, after cremation. Uh, pasty white in color is pretty true as well. Is, is it uh, burned without any casket or anything? Well, yeah, the, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but since it's coming up now, the, the material that we use when we go to the, you're not going to use a metal casket. Um, there's different ways we'll talk about different options for cremation. Some people are just cremated first without being viewed, and they might be in a very temporary container that is maybe a press wood material. Some people actually have ca wood caskets and are viewed and then cremated, so then you'd be in a wood casket. So there are both options for people. But the bottom line is you want to minimize the amount of metal. Right, but the, the wood ashes would be mixed then with the 
Those are going to kind of evaporate. So the bone material can, can survive 1400 degrees. Wood can't. Wood will just kind of evaporate. So what's left really is bone material. Now, if there is some metal in the casket, or some people have titanium plates in their bodies, those things will be there as well. So though they have like a magnet that kind of takes out all of the metal from the bone. So that's why, uh, you know, that's what some things happen. What about gold teeth? Gold, gold is a very soft metal, so that'll probably evaporate. Um, most likely, you won't see much of that left. Now I have two shoulders and two hips. <laughs> they'll be there. <laughs> most likely, they'll be left over. You don't want to take them out first. No, okay. no, because that'll just be left over. Once again, they got a magnet to take out metal okay. and leave us just with the bone. And then wood will just evaporate. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, people ask us that all the time. And to be honest, even when I was a you know, doctor many years ago, I even wondered about these things until I was you know, told what, what's going on. <laughs> so who performs cremation? Now I'm going to share with you, you're probably not going to be able to see these next few slides. I just want to take you down. This is New York State Department of Cemeteries run crematories in New York State. So I just want to give you some facts about New York State. So you, we're very specific in our state. It might be different, and you might hear stories from a different state, but there's different regulations. So in New York, um, there are 47 crematories registered with the cemetery division in New York State. 44 are not-for-profit. Two are municipally owned, like the one we use, which is Mount Hope Crematory here in Rochester. is run by the city of Rochester, and we actually feel that they do a great job, and we recommend using them for reasons we can talk about in a minute. Um, so the law states that we can't have, a, people ask us this question all the time, we cannot have a retour on site here. There's no cemetery, funeral home combinations allowed in New York State. The reason for that is, I guess, they want to keep those separate and anti, for better competition. I'm not sure what the mindset is, but we can't have one here. We would have one on site if we could. Uh, we're not allowed to. So these, some of the regulations here that they are required to do, it's got to be clean, sanitary, obviously. Um, only authorized people are allowed in the space during cremation. Um, authorization forms have to be signed. There are, there are four pages in New York State that are standardized funeral home to funeral home. You have to be filled out in those forms and nothing other than that. Other states have their own forms. Um, so ours is something we would generate, have people sign and initial all the spots, and then present them to the crematory operator before cremation can commence. So. Each cemetery is required in the state to have an identification process. So I'm going to go back to Mount Hope. We, um, we have 100% confidence in them. About six years ago, we had um, hired an outside consultant to come into Rochester from Florida, sit with us and go over our procedures, and give a surprise visit to Mount Hope and say, OK, we're going to show up at Mount Hope, and we're going to have our checklist, and we're going to take them through. They're not, know they're not knowing we're coming. Let's see if they pass. He shows up takes them through all the steps, and they pass with flying colors. Um, one of the things that they do is, is a metal disc process with a number on it. It's a duplicative process because we do it as well. Um, and I'll talk about our system later. But they are better required to track this so that when we arrive, they're, they're assigned a number. So in their records, there's a metal disc, and in our records, there's a metal disc. So it's, it's almost doing the job twice. But we feel, and you'll hear about it later, we need to do ours as well in addition to the cemetery. But there's a system for both. A um, couple more things. Um, is a funeral director necessary? People ask us that all the time. Can I just have me myself brought over to a crematory? No. Um, in fact, the only person allowed to transport a deceased human being in New York State is a funeral director. So if you were to die at home, an ambulance can't then move you. Um, and in fact, I've had that situation come up where someone's actually on a stretcher and technically the, 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 the ambulance people cannot move you. They have to call us up and transfer for them from their stretcher to our stretcher, uh -huh. and then we take possession or the medical examiner at that point. Um, so medical examiner and funeral directors are the only ones <coughs> moving deceased people. Um, in New York, we're, you know, we're the ones that have to sign the forms. So you can't do a cremation without a signature from a funeral director saying, yep, we've done all our paperwork, everything's fine, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, the family signed, we signed, um, and we're kind of you know, necessary in that process. Um, do you have a choice of a crematory facility? Yes. Um, certainly we would use any crematory. We do highly recommend Mount Hope for the fact that they, they invested in themselves about uh, six years ago, seven years ago, where they put in two brand new retorts, put in a very nice facility. Um, their procedures are wonderful. There's, there's a national organization, CANA, which they're all trained and 
proper procedures for cremation. Um, so we really highly recommend Mount Hope um, for those reasons. And there's not I'm not saying that somebody else isn't good. It's just that we're real comfortable with them. Can you sign your own cremation authorization form? You used to be able to, but about 10 years ago, that stopped. Um, what happens is the next of kin has to get permission for cremation. The person who died can't pre-sign. The reason for that is the state wants to be sure that the family is involved with the process and comfortable with the process and not objecting in, in the end, because they're really the people in charge of someone's affairs. So they want to make sure that the people who are alive are signing permission, not the person pre-signing. So that changed. But Medical there implants. Is, there is no. There's always somebody. Um, so, in the absence of family, public administrator gets involved. Um, years ago, they never would permit a cremation through the public administrator's office because they were afraid because it's so final that some family member might appear out of nowhere and object to the cremation. However, the public administrator has now in the last 10 years now allowed for cremation and they can sign in the absence of survivors saying it's okay to have a cremation performed. Um, so we do work with the public administrator on times when there's nobody to take over. Who is the public administrator? Frank Iacovangelo is the public administrator currently and he has staff that helps um, administer all that. So that, you know, and it can come up too when you got people fighting, you know, if, if there's a parent and there's, a, and there's only two children and they can't come to an agreement. Uh, we've had it happen here where we have to refer ourselves to the public administrator to say, you got to break the tie. It's 50-50 and we need, a, we need your consultation. Is the funeral director staying on the premises for the, during the cremation? This is how, well, well let's hold that thought because I'm going to explain okay. to you how we do it later. Oh, okay. Um, we have a whole system that we, we utilize. Um, this next one can, you know, this, it says no. Can personal items be placed in with the remains to go be placed into a crematory? It says no. Um, there are some things sometimes that go with the person to be cremated. Um, certainly we're not, we try to minimize that, but there are some requests that we just say, yeah, go ahead and place that with the person and, and it goes to the crematory. Um, we kind of sometimes turn a blind eye to that, but um, it's usually not a lot of things. For, for example, um, people will just, you know, like a, a teddy bear, or, you know, they're not supposed to technically be in the casket or container for cremation. We, we do that stuff. You know, one of the things we tell people, things like religious symbols might be better to hang on to and place where the cremated remains later rather than having those symbols be burned. For example, I have uh, someone being cremated today, and the cemetery gave him a cross, and I told him, let's hang on to that, when the cremated remains come back, we'll put the cross in with the ashes later. Oh, yeah. Rather than burning it. Right, um, right, so. Right. That makes more sense, you know, like a rosary, for example. Right. Why would you burn a religious item that you could save for later? Um, so, casket necessary? No, there are containers that are just basic containers for cremation, or a casket if you're going to do a viewing first. Um, we'll talk about, we'll skip over options for cremation later. We'll talk about that. Mike's going to talk about that. Can you view the procedure? Yes. Um, one of the reasons why we use Mount Hope is when you arrive there, um, there's a window, so there's, there's some shutters on it. Um, people, they, they call it a praying room that's adjacent to the cre cremation retort area. You are allowed to go there to say a prayer. If you feel like you want to witness, you can open those shutters and watch uh, the hearse back in and the container go into the retort if you are comfortable with that. Wow. Um, I, will, I was going to save this for later, but since we're talking about it now, my brother and I, in our steps, one of the steps we allowed for seven or years ago when we created these steps, which you'll hear about later, the one item we thought that people would say no to was this very thing. And we said that no, we, I guess we were naive. We said nobody will do it. Um, when we started offering it to people, we found out otherwise. Um, probably 40%, is that a good figure you think? Are going? Yeah, Maybe four, four to 10. So we, we didn't offer this service. I guess we were just naive. Um, when we started offering it, we were surprised by it, and we're now regretting we hadn't offered it to people in the past. We eventually wised up and now doing it, and four out of 10 are going to the crematory. Somebody I know very well, her husband died kind of young, and um, I talked to her about it. I told her, you know, that, you know, for me, I couldn't do it. I said, but I'm not gonna tell you how you should do it. And I didn't think she would say yes. She says, I can't do it, I can't do it. I knew she would say that, mm -hmm. but I said, one last thing I said to her, I said, but at any moment you can opt in right up until the very last minute. 
and, and do that. Didn't she say yes? She goes to Mount Hope. She goes into that room. Not only did she go in that room, she opened the shutters and she watched her husband go into the retort. She saw his body? Well, you're in a container, so she saw him, you know, the, the, the doors container. open and she saw the container go in. And then she okay. did it and she tells me now that she was happy she did. Okay. So, okay, I'm learning. <laughs> you know, I'm learning about what people may or may not feel is important. So, and I don't judge that. Um, I wouldn't do it. Um, but I wouldn't tell you how to do it. Um, you're not required to purchase an urn. However, um, they do come back in a plastic container. It's a black box. It's, once again, about nine inches tall by five by six. Um, we always are very safe about it. We um, put people inside of a plastic bag inside that outer container so that, God forbid, you were to drop the container and you wouldn't want to just spilling all over the place, like Meet the Parents, the movie. So we don't want that. <laughs> You know, meet the parents, the urn fell on the floor and the ashes scattered. <laughs> we don't want that. Um, so we have an interior bag. No, Make sure everybody's together. <laughs> so, some reasons people choose cremation. Now, these are reasons that we're told why people would consider it. So, cemetery space concerns. Um, some cemeteries are starting to get full. Um, Holy Ghost Cemetery, my family cemetery, <coughs> is a perfect example of that. It's only on its last section and it's filling up. Um, now this next one people tell us this services can be scheduled at a later time less immediate need to get everything done now that's a good thing but it's a double edged sword and what I'll say is this is it, it almost gets us lulled into complacency a little bit sometimes where we put it off too long you know um, if you wait two and three or four months sometimes it seems like you know you're grieving longer because you didn't stop and right. address it now we're not saying it's not bad to go one, two, three weeks out, but it, to go out two, three, four, five months, that might not be the best option. Um, you know, in, in certain dynamics, it's important to get everybody together, and they're scattered all over the country now. Um, I just did a cremation for someone, and there's, I mean, one's in England, one's in Seattle. You know, it's hard to get everybody together, so we understand that. Um, so we certainly counsel people in that, you know, let's make sure everybody's here if possible, but at the same time, let's not drag it on forever as well. Um, because what we find is sometimes you wait so long that you never do anything at all. And that's, and that's not the best thing for everybody. So once again, families are scattered throughout the country. Um, it can be a lower cost option. Um, some people feel the whole process is easier, but I would suggest that that's maybe a fallacy because there are as many options, if not more, with cremation than traditional burial. There are so many things you can do. Um, so it's a misconception that it's easier, but it, that's what people think. Well, it's just easy, this is a cremation, and let's forget about it. Um, but it's really not that simple. Okay. Talk up, if I can add to that. Um, one of the things that Dave was saying, that the misconception about cremation being easier, and it, it, it is ironic to us, because if you're not cremated, you must go to a cemetery. However, if you're cremated, let's think about this. You could go to a cemetery. You could be brought home. You could be scattered. You could be split up. You could have some in the cemetery, some scattered, some split up. So what Dave was saying, so look what just happened there. While people's perception that cremation is an easier selection to make the process easier, it in fact is not. It, it, it gives you more choices and more options. So the misconception Dave was talking about is, is just based on the fact that you know, if we have a dead body, by law, it eventually has to find its way to a cemetery. Cremated remains, as we just saw, it's, it's, there's so many different things that you can do. So it's not easier, and actually, I've had some people tell me as I presented those options to them, but I thought this was easier. And, you know, I simply respond with, well, the good news is you're here with us, and we're going to be kind of make sure that you have all the information so that your choice is a long-lasting and a good one. So I think that's a huge, huge misconception. So this slide here talks about, you know, communication. Communication is important. Uh, you know, I, I had a situation recently where a guy dies, he's kind of young, his daughter is at a table, we're discussing cremation. And everybody was good with cremation around the table except for one person, that daughter. Um, and they never talked about it ahead of time. She sat and talked about it and everything was okay and then she just, anxiety was growing in her while we were going through the planning process. We got all said and done with everything. And she finally said, I'm not comfortable with this. Um, if that conversation took place ahead of time, that anxiety would have been lessened for her. 
They could have communicated, they could have talked about it and then worked out, is it a good option, is it not a good option? Um, but not having a family meeting to talk about this, I think, is really leaving things you know, open-ended that it really shouldn't be. But, but don't you think that it's the person, like, you know, I'm dead, it's my decision? Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. I, 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 you know, because think about it. Y yeah, I mean, for me, you should honor my wishes. But if I've got a survivor like my wife that says, well, I'm the one here, and the funeral's, you know, I have to be the one that goes through the funeral, it has to be good for me and, and suit my needs as well. You've got to come to reconciliation, you know. So certainly you've got to keep both, you know, it's a balance, right? Sometimes you've got to come to the center. Um, and that's like anything else in life. You know, sometimes you've got to look at all the factors, and sometimes people just aren't aware of it. And they say, yeah, I want cremation in a vacuum, that's great. But then, well, my daughter didn't want it. Well, I, I didn't know my creation that, you know, I'm not that adamant about it. Maybe I'll do something to make her more comfortable. That's that give and take, that a family communication. You may never come to the middle, but at least it's been discussed. And someone can at least say, okay, I'm, I'm accepting it because dad wanted cremation. We talked about it. You know, we, it's much better to do it that way than to have it happen the way this did, this occurred. You know, because it really, I get the anxiety was just building in her, and I just thought it was because her dad died, and then found out that she wasn't comfortable with this whole discussion. You know, and she didn't speak up until the very end. So think about if she kept that inside. Mm -hmm. Now, and then we actually did eventually bury him. Um, and, the, and the wife, she was fine with it. Everybody else was fine with it. He may not have been fine with it. <laughs> um, but because they didn't have that conversation ahead of time, he ended up getting buried when he wanted cremation. But they're in charge, right? So, yeah. I, that's why I that's why I mean it's so important. You, can, you should be able to decide who who's involved in this, the government? No. <laughs> no, that's the thing. That's the thing. That's why and we're gonna come down to this in a second. I'll talk about that. Um, so yeah, once again, what are my wishes for myself? Communicate to your family. This is what I'm thinking about, you know, and get some feedback. Most of the times it's, it works out fine, but sometimes, you know, there's a give and take. Um, what do they need? You know, for once, Mike's going to talk a little bit about services. You know, cremation is disposition. What do you do with the body? But what do you need? My opinion, there's one universal in funerals, and I don't think you can short circuit this. This is the one thing I believe, universally, is that you need to gather when someone passes. Oh, I don't in some know. way. And gather. And, and, and the one thing I'll say about this is this. A gathering can take on a lot of things. It could just be friends getting together to have lunch together if you've only got a few survivors. It can be calling hours, it can be a service in a church, it can be a, for all I care, it could be a luncheon somewhere. But to stop and say, okay, something happened, there's an, an event occurred, let's recognize that, let's come together. And what it is is people want to lean on each other and support one another. It could be a phone call. There's a need to, to gather. If it's on the phone, it's a gathering. It's talking to support one another. I don't think you can short circuit that need. Um, how you go about doing it, that's for discussion. Um, certainly communication, you know, I just had some conversations with people today. There's, there's, there's life insurance, there's people that want to put money in a trust. There's, you know, all kinds of ways to, to pay for a funeral, but let's talk about it as a family so that we're, and we're aware of it, right? <laughs> let's know that dad has a life insurance policy um, that's going to pay for his funeral. Don't put it in a safety deposit box and not talk about it. Tell somebody. Um, you know, because it can take away a lot of the anxiety. Right. I had a woman, and I'll share this story with him about two years ago, which I thought, I'm not going to use names obviously, but I thought it was kind of cruel that the husband never told her what they had. She had no idea what was in the bank, didn't know if he had life insurance, didn't know if he had retirement money, didn't know anything. I thought that was cruel to her to not know. She was sitting here telling me, I don't even know if I have a dollar to pay you. Oh I thought it was awful. It was. Um, you know, communicate. <laughs> so now, this comes up. Um, Feel agents. You know, you mentioned earlier what happens when there's nobody in the family surviving. So there's no children, no spouse, no, you know, no grandchildren. You can appoint a funeral agent to be your advocate for your funeral. So you can say, okay, my neighbor is the person that knows me best at this point in my life. Put it on paper. You know, we've got a form here you can sign saying, my funeral agent is Joe Smith, and he knows about my arrangements plans. He knows about, you know, what the financial situation is. You might want to make them the beneficiary of life insurance so they can pay for the funeral. Um, that's an important document in New York State, so you can appoint somebody. Can I appoint a funeral agent even though I do have an accident? Yes, so I could be married to my wife and I could say, well, 
I don't trust her to do what I want. And my brother, he's my agent. That would go over well in my house, but I could do that. That would be great for me. <laughs> and Jack is tough, so I don't know. Yeah. That would be a funny thing to do. I can actually rescind that. <laughs> We're not taping this, are we? <laughs> it's only for the funeral, though, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be anything else. It's just for the funeral. <laughs> It's, funeral it's as a whole. It's the, the funeral agent is just specifically for funeral details and nothing more. So the it's, funeral agent could actually have me cremated even though my next of kin said no. Right. Oh, and I want that. Yes. Now this this form, not only do you sign it, but you have to have two witnesses. So it has to be. It's a very official document to know that you're of sound mind. You're signing off the persons of sound mind. Two witnesses. And let me tell you one story. I asked, who was here last time? Probably heard this story. I don't know if I talked about it. I had a situation where a, a man was dying. His, whoops. His his uh, daughter was next of kin. He appointed his neighbor as the agent. He sat in my office. Said my, my agent is my is my my neighbor. She was in charge. I got the phone call on a Friday night. I was working. This woman had some choice words for me, and I said. Because their relationship was awful. I said, well, this is what we're doing. Uh, your dad came in ahead of time. We planned the funeral. He signed a form giving this person permission to be the agent for the funeral. This is what's planned. This is what we're doing. And I welcome you with open arms to come celebrate your dad's life. Well, she didn't do that. Um, the thing is, all she was doing at that point, because their, their relationship was so poor, that all she was looking for was, what can I get? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, now, he knew this ahead of time, so he pointed at her as the agent, because she, she would have thrown him to the curb. <laughs> so, important document. Um, and, and this will also come up, too. When, you know, the reason why that came about was same-sex relationships before we had marriages in New York State. That's when this came up, so they could give people who were you know, cohabitating with somebody legal status. You could put it in paper. Uh, but now we don't have that problem. Now we have marriage in New York State. Um, so how do you create a plan that honors your wishes and takes care of my family and friends' needs? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Mike's going to come forward and speak on, now in your folder you have two brochures that they look like this. Um, Mike and I, that question came up, we said, well, how do we tell people, you know, that the funerals are important? And Dr. Alan Wolfelt, uh, he's a grief educator from Colorado, put on this why seminar, why do we have funerals? And Mike went out to it uh, three years ago. Oh, wow, Maybe four years ago, and so I'm going to have him talk about what Alan wrote, um, and he and Alan's very passionate about what he believes in, in, in death care and what's what helps people heal. So Mike's going to come and talk about these two brochures for you. So a couple things, um, you know, we talk about. We're not going to get too deep into all of these different things. Two seminars ago, we did, uh, but it's worthy of talking about today because I think one of the things that happens is. People have a misconception of not only what can they do, type of funeral can you have if you're cremated, but then I always go back to why do we do certain things? Um, there are several emotions that gathering will bring out. And as David mentioned, gathering means different things to different people. But in the lack or absence of gathering, there's one word that creeps up, and that's loneliness. And that's what happens. So, Regardless of what your religious beliefs are, what your personal beliefs are, uh, there's some things that we need to be aware of to help us in the process. You, know, you talk about all these things, transcendence, meaning, expression, support, recall, reality. Transcendence, well, okay, wait a minute. We're transcending from life to life. That, yeah. We're here, we're gone. Think about that for a second. Anybody that loves you, that's going to have an impact on their lives, don't you think? Can't not. Uh, we talk about meaning, you know, what did that person mean to you? I have this saying that when somebody dies, it's a natural reaction that we, that we all have. We take inventory. Every single one of us does this. Painful as it may be, think back to a time when somebody you love died. It's the first thing you did. Started remembering things. Started talking about those things that you remembered started to, and, and I think what we do is, we do it naturally, because we don't want to what? Forget. Forget them. <laughs> right. You know, someone said to me, hey, losing a loved one's the hardest thing in life you'll ever go through, and I'll argue that point till the day I die myself. Okay. There's something worse, and that's forgetting them. Uh -huh. 
and forgetting we had, right? Yeah, you're going to get ready to bop me on the head, right? I don't blame you for that. <laughs> I, I, I ducked. I was going to throw something in. But the reality is, losing someone is one of the most painful things we can experience. But forgetting them, we have control over. I can't control my death any better than any of you it's can, right. or right. people that we love. But know this, we have the ability to always remember them. So that inventory process happens. Okay. Expression. So the, as we start to do our inventory, we move out into expression. And the pamphlet, by the way, that you have fulfilled, um, I've heard him speak, I don't even know how many times now. He is the foremost expert, and I use the word expert, on grief and death care anywhere in the world. He is that good. I've heard, probably heard him talk on different topics 10, 11, 12 times. I stopped counting. He's that good at what he does. He's dedicated his entire life to this one subject, grief. Now, from there, obviously, it's, it's done this. Grief starts here, and then all the things after that. So when I talk about these things, I'm going to say that you know, the research, the background, all of his degrees, his PhDs, his doctorates, He's written, I don't know, how many hundreds of books. Um, if you think of it, when you get home, you know, put Ellen Wolfelt's name in the computer and watch what pops up. So he came up with these things, not myself. After we go to, well, what did the person mean to us? Expression. That's the outward. Uh, expression takes many forms. It takes a smile. It takes a tear. So it starts to bring about our emotions. Um, support. You know, David talked about this. David talked about this, and I tapped into it too. You know, in the absence of support, and that gathering is what helps us to get that support. In the absence of support is loneliness. You know, everybody always says, and this is what happens, and some of you may have experienced in the room, right? You lose a loved one, and the first couple weeks, everything's great because you've got people coming to the door, people calling you, people stopping by, you know, a gift basket that comes to the house. Now that gift basket by itself, maybe you don't need it. Say, so what am I going to do with another piece of flowers? But you felt good knowing that somebody thought as much of you to send that basket. So support comes in multiple forms. Recall. We talked about that too. So as kind of as we're going through meeting, we have that recall effect where, where we're trying to figure out, well, what did that person mean to me? And how is my life going to now be different? The recall portion is the part of that inventory. And then finally, reality. Um, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard this, I would long since have been retired. And it goes something like this. I can't believe Bob's dead. Think about that. The person smart, educated, sat with the person, watched them die. And they said, I can't believe Bob's dead. Doctors told you three months ago it was going to happen. You're on hospice, right? So what are people really saying when they say this? I don't want to believe right. Bob's dead. Right. So reality is something that we will all come to in a different way. Uh, some of us have more challenges with that than others. But by denying any of these steps in the process does not allow us to accept the reality of what's happened. So very, 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 very important things. As we go into um, some of the different things, and we talked about this um, at, uh, again, a couple seminars ago. So cremation, what can we do? Now, there's all these different elements of service, music, readings, visitation, slash reception, uh, eulogy, or remembrance, or symbols, gathering actions. A lot of different things that are we can talk about with that. Again, they're in your pamphlets. Here's the thing that I can tell you. So. Uh, how many, well, first of all, I always like to know who my audience is. How many people of here have ever made arrangements for a loved one? Okay, less than half. Interesting. How many people have done it twice? Down to five, six, three. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> so it's something that we don't do all that often, right? 30 years for me, over, over 10,000 funerals. So there's certain things that we see that work. There are certain things we see that fail. As your advocate, we never want to see you fail. We never want to see your family harmed. We always want what's best for you. Now there lies the problem. Sometimes what we know to be best uh, is not in agreement with what the family says. Well, naturally, we're going to do what we're told. But not before we've told you, hey, guys, here's some things to consider. 
Here's some things we want you to be aware of. And then ultimately, you guys own the scale, and we're going to do whatever you tell us. But there's always that balancing act. I use this story, and I've got some familiar faces in the room, so the familiar faces have heard me say this before, because I say it every time. When we're talking philosophically about what's my funeral going to look like, Here's some things that I'll share with you, a couple great points. Number one, my funeral has nothing to do with me. Right? Think about that. So my, when I die, the benefits or the lack thereof is not going to affect who? Me. Or God. Right. <laughs> However, right, right? Yeah. So you say, what's the difference? What's the difference? I love this one. Throw a big party. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Hey, mom's dead. This is great. Dave, let's go have a party. We're gonna get balloons and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna bounce off of mountaintops and well wait a minute. Wait time out. Mom died. We're in that transcendence phrase from her being alive to dying. We I need that support. I need people to come together. I need to do what? Get my inventory together. I need to have my recall. So all these different things. Next one that, that I love to share, and again, people, you've heard me tell this story. Great friend of mine, since he was in third grade, he might as well be a brother just like David is. And he said to me one day, talking about his funeral, and hopefully this is a lesson that we can all glean from. He said to me, and we were having a serious talk, which for he and I to have a serious talk is unusual. <laughs> I will tell you that in advance, but he got, he got real intense. He looked at me and says, Mike, come on. What's the difference with all this stuff? When I'm gone, I'm gone. He says, throw a big party. He made that comment. And he says, just talk, put me in a burlap bag and toss me in the river. Oh, jeez. Oh, and you got to know my buddy. He was serious as a heart attack. I kid you not. So, so anyways, so, right. So I said to him, I said, look, look I got to do it. Because, but here's some things that are going to happen. I'm going to lose my funeral director's license. There's a good chance Dave's not going to have a place to come to work to because we're going to lose a funeral home. And I'm probably going to go to jail. I'll do all those things on one condition. So he looked at me and said, well, what's the one condition, Mike? I said, what color burlap bag shall I use when your mother dies? Green. When your mother dies? When his mother dies. Oh. Now, I just about offended him, which was my intention. Yeah, right? And I could do this with him. I wouldn't do it on any of you. Right, right, right. But I said, what color burlap bag shall I use when mom dies? Now he looked at me, and his forehead, he's got this vein that runs right about here. And he gets excited, he gets red in that vein. Honestly, God, he comes out. And I could see it coming. I thought, one or two things, we're going to have a great talk or we're going to fight. I'm not yeah. sure which. So his veins popping in his forehead, he turns red, and he says to me, well, that would be different. <laughs> I looked at him. I said, oh, really? How so? Well, now his tongue was tied because he didn't have an answer. So he said to me, are you going to teach me something? And I said, well, if you're going to listen, maybe. But if you're not, I'm about to waste my breath. And that's where I shared with my body. I said, look, stop telling people how to feel. Stop telling people how to mourn. Stop micromanaging their grief from the grave. Because it doesn't work. In the 10,000 times that I've done this, any single time that someone has attempted, and it's always well intended, it's givers that do this. I love, I love the givers. Because the givers are the first ones that say what? Oh, don't, don't fuss. Don't worry about me. This is the person that did everything for everybody for their whole lives, right? <laughs> That's the way it goes. So um, that person wants to minimize the effect that they're going to have in that transcendence period. Okay? When, they, when they've gone from living to dead, wants to minimize that effect. And you know what? My grief is mine. When I lose a loved one, gosh darn it, I need it. Because my grief is what's going to help me to get better. My grief is what's going to help me to move down the road. And I always say this, there's no such thing as closure. should never be a goal of any funeral because it's unattainable. And there is no such thing as moving on. We want to get ourselves to be able to do what? Move forward. Right, right. Move forward. Best way to explain all of this, uh, every time somebody dies, a piece of our heart goes with them. That empty space, okay, is never going to be replaced. And that's not the goal of the funeral, and that should, be, should not be the goal of anybody's grief journey. What we want to do is heal that piece, heal around that piece, and be able to move forward and do so in a healthy way. I have, uh, on my dad's side, my grandmother died I was a year old. I was the oldest of the grandchildren on that side of the family. I'm the only grandchild she ever saw. I don't remember her, 
but I still kind of grieve for her because I never got to know her. Right. See what I mean? So I'm grieving for somebody that I can't even remember. And it's okay. And I think that's some of the things that we forget sometimes. So all the things I've just led into talking about who's the funeral for, hugely important. You've got great support materials to, to, to help support that. So what can we do? Misconceptions. Well, if you're cremated, that's it. You know, you can't do any of these things here. It's not true. So someone says to me, can cremation be less money? And I say, well, it can be. And they'll say, well, what do you mean it can be? You can still have visitation, viewing. The person can even be brought to church, and then cremation can follow. Burial can still happen in a cemetery. So cremation by itself is a final form of disposition. It's what you do before and after that cremation that is going to be what will honor your wishes, but also or it's going to be what's going to help your family and friends through their grief journey. No matter what you think, I will promise you this, you cannot take away their grief journey. It's impossible. My gosh, if we could find a way to do that, Dave and I would be a bazillionaires. We wouldn't have a funeral home. We'd have a little, a couple little offices, and we'd sit down and click a button, and gosh darn it, your whole, everybody that loves you would be fine. That would be awesome, because I wouldn't have to have the expense of heating and cooling and taxes and whatnot. Um, but I can assure you, it's not possible. It's totally not possible. So what we want to do is we want to create a funeral that's going to have meaning. We want to create a funeral that's going to be, you know, uh, uh, honors our wishes for myself. But then we want to create that funeral that's going to take care of the needs of others. My pre-need, and by the way, that my brother wanting to appoint me as the agent over his wife, oh my gosh, that would be absolutely horrible. And there's a part of, and anybody who doesn't want to be an agent, you can deny it on the bottom. And I'm going to sign, no, 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 no. I'm going to pass it back to her. Um, the, everything that we're doing is to create your opportunity to be honored and your family's needs. Now, I'm going to tell you this, crystal ball, another way Dave and I can be bazillionaires. If I had this crystal ball, you know, you talked about gathering, meeting with your family. Here's what's going to happen. Any of your kids are not going to want to talk about it. They're not going to want to sit down with you. You're going to have to press them. The danger is that we're going to then try to make a plan, you know, without knowing where they're going to be. So the lesson here is create flexibility. I have a, mine and my wife's pre needs are done. They're in the file in the other room with everybody else's that we care for. Um, I was very specific. Being a funeral director, you might well imagine that I, I was probably that way. But on the bottom, I put huge red letters. These are my wishes only. If somebody has a need that is in contradiction to my wish. Don't worry about my wish. Take care of your need. Why did I do that? Because I know that my funeral's not about me. The benefits of that funeral, good or bad, are going to be for those who care about me. So a couple things. We're not going to go any deeper into any of those things. Some things I will tell you. Having a family discussion is great. <coughs> but having the information to have the right family discussion that's where we come in. That's where we encourage everybody to say, hey, come on in, spend an hour and pick our brains. We don't have to get any paperwork out. We don't have to do anything. So now you become empowered. You can, we can start to take what your wishes are and then kind of try to identify what some of the needs might be for your family members and begin to you know, sculpt that first version of your funeral plan. Now you can sit down, you've got some information, you can sit down and have that discussion, but what I promise you is what you don't want to do, and there are, here's where the danger is, do not say to your loved ones, like my friend did that day, put me in the burlap bag and toss me in the river. <laughs> because that very same burlap bag that he thought was awesome for him is not what he needed or wanted if it were his mother. And there's the, so again, that's where we come in, we sit with you guys, we'll go through everything, we'll help you find, David mentioned it earlier, middle ground, what is it? And sometimes it's hard to get to. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you that it's not. I've had it in my own family, on my wife's side of the family. We had funeral aid chosen, um, and again, some of you people have heard me tell this story. Funeral aid was chosen, uh, they would not, you know, a mother-in-law is not gonna listen to her son-in-law in the way that you are, thank you. <laughs> you look at me as a professional, a mother-in-law says, well, that's just Mike. My wife looks at me as, well, that's just my husband. What could he possibly know? Um, the first funeral that we had after my wife and I had come together um, wasn't the right one. 
and they weren't open to what I had to offer. And my wife will tell you today, 15 years later, she still regrets it. She still regrets it because it wasn't what she needed. It wasn't what other family members needed. Now, her grandmother was well-intended. and it was, That was the first one. She was well-intended in everything that she said. But ultimately, it didn't match up. And that's not to say that it can't match up. But the lesson here is leave flexibility when you're having those discussions, finding the middle. There are ways to do that. In that short period of time where we had all those deaths in our family, the last death of the six that we had in a short two-year span was, in fact, my mother-in-law. We found middle ground. And while my mother-in-law said she wanted X, my wife and her brothers said they needed Y. So we found the best of both worlds. We found a way to respect what her wishes were and her privacy and the dignity that she wanted, but then we also took care of the needs. And I think that's the thing. Because again, if we all had the crystal ball, we could write that plan with certainty. Know that, that that's not possible, so be open to flexibility. Any questions before I step down and give it back to Dave? Yes. I have a question. Um, what happens when the wife, um, say she's in her 80s and she doesn't know where the bank accounts are, where anything is, and she comes to you guys because the husband has to wait? How do you handle the funeral and everything if she doesn't know where any of this Great is? Great question. Um, we're so blessed in that, you know, Dave and I represent the third generation, so it's 95 years in the community. So there are a great number of people that walk in, and, and, and many of the familiar faces in this room, you have carte blanche here. We don't do credit checks on anybody ever. Spinner Home's never done a credit check in 95 years on any one person. Um, we, we know who we're dealing with in most cases. Um, and then for those who we don't know what we're dealing with, you know, we, it's a gut check. You know, Dave and I might have a discussion, and I might say, hey Dave, this is what I got, what do you think? Um, so in those cases, we work with the family the best way we can. You know, one of the things that we, you know, you're talking about money, well, one of the things that you could, you're probably all imagining, you say, well, geez a whiz, um, the funeral home's just worried about getting paid. Well, maybe so. But there's a flip side of that argument. If you don't have the money to pay us, you still owe. So, that, so we want to work with that family to make sure that whatever they choose and whatever the, the end funeral is, is that it's comfortable. So we do everything we can. We ask lots of questions, some of which will be invasive in terms of privacy, financial questions. And everything that we talk about in that conference room stays in that conference room. You know, Dave and I always say, we're going to the grave with more secrets than dear Abby's ever going to have. I tell you that. And there isn't a priest that's heard confession that's heard what we have heard. <laughs> There's not a doubt in my mind that we, oh boy. <laughs> so, so again, we've never turned a family away in that situation, but we empower them with our with our experience for example if somebody worked at rochester products and if they worked there for x number uh, was it over 10 years they become vested and they have an insurance policy there is no binder that comes home there's no binder anywhere in that home there was no there was no payment ever made so well wait a minute so, but your dad worked at rochester products you know what here's a phone number to call how many years did he work there well here's a phone number to call human resources i'm going to bet you there's an insurance policy mm -hmm. there's an example so we take what we know and understand about you know living and working here every day and being three generations along, we're able to step in and, and help folks through that. But that's a great, that's a great, great question. Mike, yeah. would you be able to like? I mean, I'm going to take care of all this stuff, but like for people that don't go into the estate. So <laughs> here's the problem with estates. Um, we work for you. We don't work for the estate. So okay. I'll give you an example. So let's presume my dad were to pass away. David and I are fighting. And he wants money and I want money. So this whole process of going through the estate, because he and I are fighting, right, it gets drawn out. It's not done in six months. It's two years. Now, I assure you, while we do everything we can to help, two years for us are getting paid. It, yeah. it, it, it's, if everybody was doing it, I assure you, Dave and I wouldn't be here talking right. today. We'd have long since been bankrupt and be doing something else. So there's that fine line of, you know, if I know the attorney, if I know the estate has liquidity, meaning monies that they'll be able to get to quickly, if I know the background of the family, they're not fighting, they're getting along, and that's dangerous for me because while you're not fighting today, and all of a sudden the world gets red, and holy cow, all of a sudden here comes the fight yeah, 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 yeah. now. 
so we, we make a judgment call on that. It's not our practice to do that, but we do make a judgment call on that. Yeah. Uh, do you uh, participate in burial accounts or like pre-need? Sure do. Yeah. Um, and which bank do you use? Uh, right now, we're using the, uh, uh, through the Funeral Directors Association, it's called pre-plan, and the deposits are with, they ultimately go through M&T, right? They, no, well, M&T handles the money, but it, they're invested every month, whatever. Capital yeah, so, and all kinds of places. so New York State's got some, some tight laws, which are good. Uh, the, money, uh, the money goes into a CD. Uh, the, the rates of return that you would get on a CD are, are you know, probably what, less than half of a percent now? We're getting two and a quarter? No, it's like 1.9 right now. 1.9? Okay, so it went down even more. So, so, and the reason why we're able to get that is, is because, you know, we're able to, we're not, while we don't own every individual account, we're responsible with where we put them on behalf of each family that we have. And the deposits are, you know, pretty significant, uh, over $4 million in all these individual accounts. So we can bargain in a way that, that for all of you, that we as individuals can't bargain for ourselves. In my 30 years, we've probably been with eight or nine different banks. My, why? Why do we change it around? Because when one, your bank gets lazy, I'm going to go to your bank and then your bank, and I'm going to make the two of you fight for giving the best rate, because ultimately I work for the people, not the bank. Right. 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 So the funds are set up in a CD, they're no different than, and it's 100% protected. So if I went to the bank right now and I, made, I put $10,000 in an account and I make you my beneficiary, you legally have no access to that money until I die because I'm the owner of that money. And up until the point in time that I die, I can change the beneficiary to anybody I want. That's the exact way that the accounts are set up for people who come in and not only pick their plan, but then want to set the money aside to pay for it. The word prepay is what's used. I'll tell everybody, don't say prepay. It's not what's happened, it's prefund. Because prepay by definition, and that's dangerous, means you give us the money. But what if we want to go to Hawaii? What if we go bankrupt? And your money goes with us. So prefunding is what happens, but you are still the owner of your funds. I explain if I want to donate my body or body parts to mm -hmm. science, yep. quote unquote. I know I have something to do with cremation. Right. How does that whole process work? Okay, so there's there, there's two different ways that that can happen. So Brad's question was, um, when I'm going to donate uh, the body donation or parts, uh, what happens? Well. If there's a body donation, a flat out body donation, uh, Strong, uh, U of R uh, uh, Medical Center over in Strong, they have a program, so your body gets donated for that. That will not happen at the time of your passing if you've not signed up with them. So the first thing you need to understand is, is for that process to happen, you need to already have an understanding with them and have a contract and paperwork filled out. So. That will not happen without the paperwork, no matter what your intentions are, if that paperwork's not done in advance. And here's why. They'll do a whole background on it. They want to make sure that you're a candidate for what they intend to use your body for. And most often, it's for teaching doctors and nurses. That's what it's really for. Everybody talks about research. I'm going to say no. <laughs> it's so that they, they can learn where all the body parts are. Um, now, organ donation, different where we're donating a part of our body, as we age, we are less of a candidate for donation. So you can say, I want my heart donated. If you're 85, God love you. And I think if you walk every day in a better shape than I am, I assure you this, they're not going to take your heart. <laughs> uh, they will not. However, they might take your corneas. They might take your corneas and even skin. And when you get to be 85, about all, and when you get older, about the only thing that they really want and will take and they can use as corneas. So the younger you are, the more apt that you are, that your parts, whether it be skin or tissues or bone, uh, is actually usable. Okay. And organ transplant is, it's young people. An 85 year old heart, they're not gonna spend $400,000 to transfer into somebody else and that heart in, that heart stopped already. already. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> okay, so, so you sign the organ donor card, and then how is it determined? Who determines they're saying, okay, we don't need any of this person's organs? Then you guys take, oh, I don't, this is where I'm trying to, where is it? So, okay. what trips it, right? Yeah, what because I am an organ donor. So, organ, organ donors, so if you're an organ donor, and we're, we're aware of that, so first, first things first. Somebody in your family needs to be aware of that. Well, the people that are in charge of my... So they need to be aware of it so that if you were in an institution, they can speak on your behalf and say, well, she was an organ donor. Okay. So you start there. 
at the point, we can't, we don't start the process, nor can we stop it. But communicating, like they said earlier, communication is huge. This is another one of those examples. You need to communicate all that to the people that care for you. Yeah, you and go. then now, in that particular case, then uh, the different organizations that are local, the Rochester Iron Parks Bank is what it's called, that group there uh, will determine whether you're a candidate or not. And then they tell us, okay, and then we move forward. Okay, so they take whoever takes the parts, and then you, in the end, you, you get the bottom. That's what I Now, mean. in Brad's question, we're going to come full circle now. <laughs> in Brad's question, he was saying, okay, and I think where he was leading, and he put, but he put two phrases in there, so I brought in two issues. So, at Strong, if your body was donated, right. um, they, it's usually about a year later, um, and then they will have, once they're all done doing what they're going to do with your body, they will have you cremated, and they give the cremains back to the family. I'll tell you right now, if you're morbid obese, you, they, they're not going to take no, you. No. Because they can't have no, you. No, because I found that out. Here's, here's some things to think about. While what they do is good, remember what Dave said earlier? He was talking about, well, cremation is great because you can delay things, right? Delay well, delaying it one year is extremely difficult. When you have people, because anybody, anybody here have to-do list, checklist? Who's got a to-do list? I, I mean, am I the only one that's got a to-do list in their life? Joe's got one. I think we've got some liars in here. We got, but you always have things that you've got to do, right? I got a kitchen too. Okay, you got a kitchen too. So you know what? Could you imagine burial right way down on the bottom? Yeah, oh boy. And, it's, and it never gets to it for a year. So I will tell you that not every family is a candidate for that experience. Not every family's grief process is going to be um, uh, brought into a better way by waiting a year. So there's, it's a push-pull. I mean, what they do is great, but at the same time, at what expense? I don't own the scale. You know, you, you know the dynamics of your family, so I don't know if I totally answered your... Yeah, you did. You did. You did. So, went both directions and covered the whole... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. What happens in a pre-funded... Um Plans. Can the family change that even though? Oh gosh, yes, hundred times. It, it doesn't cost you to change anything. No, so, I mean, can the family not do your issues, even though you put, you put Okay, great right? question. All right, can the family not do your wishes? Um, yes and no. <laughs> so if you come in and you have a plan, it's called a pre need. Upon that, that pre need plan is null and void as per New York State, not as per Bartolomeo and Prado. But as per New York State, that pre-need is null and void. We have to, David and I and all our directors have to create an acne contract. The pre-need contract died with the person. However, and that's where David talked about earlier, the agent becomes really, really important. So as David said, I'm going to make John Doe my agent. But then the line that's in there, now this is where we can have some control. The line that's in there, we can say, uh, I... I appoint my agent to be in control of my funeral as per my agreement on file November 2017 with Bartolome Allen Prado Funeral Home. What that means is my agent can't come in and make changes then. And that's a good bad thing, right? We don't own the crystal ball. We don't know how that's going to go. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I struggle with that because I know where their conflict comes, we're the ones dealing with it. So while you came and said, put all these things on your agent for him and put all these limits, but then I've got your family staring back at me, and this is what happens, I need this. So it becomes tough. What we try to do, even in those cases, you have to use common sense. If somebody comes in and they, they want to change it, and, and it was very specific, and they, somebody come, the family comes in they want to change the entire funeral, the answer is no, because here's the plan. If somebody says, well, I want a green casket instead of a blue one, Technically, we're not supposed to do that. However, it's a color. So common sense needs to prevail. It's not a philosophical difference like burial versus cremation, mausoleum versus ground. It's not that viewing versus not. It's the color of a casket. So common sense has to prevail. And quite frankly, to the letter of the law, and when we agree to changing the casket from blue to green, we're probably not doing it right. But again, New York State comes up with a lot of laws that are great. And they come up with some laws that aren't so great. One of the things that we encourage you to do is not only appoint an agent, but then we have a form too that says, uh, and it talks about what I put in big red letters at the bottom of mine, where it says, 
uh, please honor my wishes, but follow the ability to change my funeral to match your needs. There's a way to do that, you know. So giving permission, and maybe you put limits on. It. Maybe you say, but but these are the things that I'm not going to just. I'm not going to. I don't want changed. My brother's giving me the clock, and he's doing this to me. So, all right. Um, <laughs> and now, Joe's <laughs> Um, just to give you a little schedule, we got probably another 20 minutes of all this, and then we'll have lunch, and I don't want you sitting for two hours, so that's why I kind of push my along a little bit. I don't want to drag it on too. Um, so what I'd like to talk about next, um, Mike talked about services. You know, what do you do with the ashes? You know, now you got now you got that container. What do I do? Um, there are many options for for cemetery considerations. Some of the things that come up. Family roots, where is everyone? Um, the lovely thing about our family, we're all together in Holy Ghost Cemetery, and I mean everybody. Um, that gives me a lot of, I told you guys when you were here last time, uh, give me a lot of confidence that my entire family is in a cemetery, and I can walk that cemetery, and everyone's there. Cemetery's not for everybody. Oops. I hit forward, didn't I? Um, but if a cemetery is something you're considering, there are in-ground options for, for cremated remains. There's columbariums. Now, columbariums, you're going to see a video in a little bit here above ground structures where you can put an urn into. There's mausoleums, which are indoor structures with a niche. It's a little smaller location to put the urn in. Um, so we've got a couple videos in a little bit here. We just got done doing these, um, and we'll show you those in a second. Scattering, sharing, keepsakes. What that means is some people will scatter cremated remains. They'll share them. Mike mentioned that earlier, where you can take a small amount. Um, you can even take an urn, and this month I've got it. Next month my sister's got it. Um, keepsakes where you divide them out, and you have three smaller urns. Uh, now, that being said, you've got to be careful because there are religious considerations. For those Catholics, don't ever tell your priest this because they'll, they'll have you on a stick. Um, they don't want that. Uh, so cremation for Catholics, they tell you they want those cremated remains in a cemetery that's Catholic cemetery. Uh, for other faiths, you've got a little more flexibility. Um, I'm going to show you the video. You're going to see the first video is going to be an option when you have cremated remains buried. And the second video will be one in a columbarium, so you can see kind of how that looks and feels in a cemetery. So I'll play that for you now. Container can be pretty heavy, yeah. About seven pounds for the cremated remains. Um, that's that's Holy Sepulchre Cemetery there. Um, in case you were wondering, yeah. um, the uh, the first thing you saw, they had that outer box that can be for burial, the place that you're in into. Holy Sepulchre is one of the few cemeteries that requires such a container like that. Some of them are starting to come now requiring these things. Years ago, you could always just take that temporary and bury it. But, uh, what's what's happened is over the years, uh, the cemeteries have been becoming more requiring more permanent structures to house the cremains. Um, the second one was that it's a brand new section of Holy Sepulchre, and it's above ground, and it's um, that whole thing, you saw those walkways, it's a, it's a nice new section they have there. Those structures may hold maybe 100 sets of cremains out, outdoors, sometimes there's a nice bench seated out there. 
Um, in the first video, uh, if you're going to bury the cremains, must, must it have an outer plastic shell? At Holy Sepulchre, yes. At, at like Riverside, no. It is actually Riverside Mount Hope just, just changed. Yeah, they just told me just. yesterday that they now want a rigid container to house the cremated remains. It's like a hard plastic exterior. So it's not a law, it's just the, the Individual cemetery. cemeteries, yep. And they're, some of the smaller cemeteries are saying they don't have a lot of requirements. Some of the bigger ones are now going to more requirements. Just so you are. It happens. You got to play within their rules because it's their cemetery. So you know it's um. Scattering looks better than <laughs> Well, and scattering, we got a handout for you. So this so happens. <laughs> we're not saying no to scattering. All we tell people, and you can read through all of these, don't do it, uh, you know, rashly. Wait. You know, don't just do it because you cannot do it. You know, wait a few months. That way you can really sleep on it and know that this is a decision I'm good with. So that once you go do it, it's okay. You can't undo it, so let's just be careful. Um, you know, some of the things on here, you'll, you can take this with you, you know, just discuss it once again with your family, you know. Um, and there may be something special. I mean, Joel Tabelli told me, you know, when he dies, he's going to be cremated. He wants to be scattered in, in, in front of your field. Well, that's really appropriate for Joel Tabelli. Right. Um, but it may, you know, it may be something that his family would never contest, but if it's something else, you know, then maybe you really want to go slow and consider it. Um, and he told me that years ago, so I'm not sure how we're going to make that one happen yet. <laughs> I, I just got to tell you this story. My daughter used to work at Disney World, and uh, when somebody wanted their cremains scattered on one of the rides, and what happened was that they scattered it while they were on the rides. Of course, Disney got a picture of it. It covered all the electronic sensors, and, and, and the ride had to be shut down, and, and the family had to clean, pay for the cleaning and the oh, revenue that they lost. So, so if they've got something wrong, you might want to think twice about where they go. Yeah, you really should be careful. I mean, like bodies of water, you really not supposed to. There are some, like there's a guy in New York City, I know he, he does that, um, and he has the right approvals from the federal government to do a scattering in a body of water. You know, like. You, know, you can't just go up to the creek over here and just scatter uh, without getting in trouble. Um, so you got to be careful where you're scattering. Is it, is it public land? Is it private land? Um, you know, even like some people put, um, I have a friend who has property in the southern tier, and, and we found out that land he owns, there was this young stillborn boy cremated in the ashes were buried on the property. And he now owns the property, and there's a little boy buried somewhere on the property. But he's in ashes. Yeah, yeah. So, so the family can't go visit. Um, so you got to be really careful. I mean, I'm not saying no to just be, you know, take your time, look at these things, consider it before you, you do that. You know, one of the things to add to that, if the decision to scatter is right today, it'll still be right in six months. But if it's wrong today and your emotions in that six month to year period are going to change, I'll guarantee that. If it's wrong today, now that you're not going to find that out until that six, 12 month period happens, and then there's no going back. So. We're not saying don't scatter, we're saying wait to scatter. Uh, golf course is another popular one. People sit there and put them in the sand traps. That's what happens every, well, wait a minute, we'll watch this one, guys. What happens every three years on a golf course to the sand traps? All the sand is removed and new sand is brought in. <laughs> so, yeah. Think about it. I had a friend who put her uncle's ashes in the hole. I thought it was a really cool place to put it because he could just put it up and get cut So now if the family doesn't want to um, do the scattering, will you guys do that? Um, yeah, I mean, we got to be careful once again, as long as it's not on a spot that's going to be like a body of water where we get in trouble. Um, so yeah, and then... And there's scatter gardens in cemeteries too, um, so that's one good option that we talked about earlier. Scatter gardens. What do you mean? Um, Riverside, um, Whitehaven, Mount Hope have areas where you can actually scatter ashes with other people that have scattered in these areas, and it's an official place. Like a party area. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> the nice thing about that is you know where they are, and you know it's okay, and you know it's not going to be purchased by somebody else someday. It's, it's for that purpose, and it's scattered, and that's fine, you know. So that might be an option to think about. Um, so now cremation. What can go wrong? Boy, oh boy. Um, oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy. I don't want to scare any of you, but I have to talk about this. You already did. Um, I Googled this two weeks ago. Cremation scandals was the keywords in Google. 360,000 results oh came my up. Gosh. 
Wow. Not reputable. Um, and then you can just scroll away through all of these. Um, you really got to be careful. And to give you a highlight of some of the things, the most well-known one, you've probably heard about Georgia. That guy who had a crematory, he wasn't cremating people, he was placing them in the backyard because he didn't want to bother cremating them. Yes. Um, at first people thought, well, why would he do that? Maybe the retort was not functional and he just figured he wasn't going to repair it. Well, they found out that it was functional. So all he was saving was maybe $10 worth of natural gas to fire the machine. Um, and they found 300 bodies. Oh my God. Yeah, oh I mean, it's God. crazy. Um, he was giving back funeral directors, he was a crematory operator, giving back cremated remains um, that were like cinder ash or like a material for cement mix or whatever it was, and, and they didn't know any better. Oh my God. <coughs> um, you gotta be a little careful about who you're using. <laughs> uh, the, um, you know, this is, since we just pulled it up on the internet yesterday. There's some articles in the paper from 2002 in California. Baby was another one up in, in, in New Hampshire, which was after Georgia, um, and they found that there was no good systems in place to not mix people up. And, uh, the other one that kind of sticks out a little bit here locally, kind of bites here locally, we all remember about 10 years ago, the, the tissue harvesting scandal. You oh, that? yeah. Taking yeah. body parts and yeah. all of those people were going to be cremated. Um, so what happened was there were some funeral operators who were not getting permission to take tissue and bones and things like that, harvesting them and getting paid $1,000, pocketing $1,000, and then cremating all of them. Who's going to know? Well. We all found out, didn't we? Um, and those people went to jail, yeah. you know, and they should have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't Tommy himself, but it was at his funeral, his employee, yes. Yeah. He went to jail for almost 10 years. I think wow. he just got out. Um, and, that, and, and you brought up that name, and that was confusing for people. Oh, yeah. Mike and I had to sit in rooms with families. One of the operators has some familiar names, close spelling to ours, and we're sitting there, people thought for a little while maybe we were involved. Like, no. no Similar name, not us, you know, and that was fun. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so that led us, you know, let me see in a second, let me show you a couple more slides. So that led us to start asking questions. You know, how do we operate because we were being questioned? Well, so in the end, this thing really helped us out. That scandal helped us improve our operations. So let's take, walk down this road a little bit. How does a family choose the right cremation provider? So how, questions people would start asking us. How can I be sure cremated remains return on those of my loved one? Um, how do I know if my loved one is being treated with respect? Um, we signed up for a cremation with confidence program shortly thereafter because we had to do something. We had to, you know, we had to reinstill confidence in the community, even though we weren't involved. You know, the community was harmed by a couple of local funeral homes. Oh, yeah. um, so and then it, it can happen, you know, and so this system. They had 10 steps that we bought into this system um, that they recommended. But once again, every state has law. So Mike and I are looking at this 10 steps exam. No, it doesn't work in New York. Um, so what I'd like to do in your folder is cremation with confidence. There are 10 steps in here. Mike and I sat down, and um, we tweaked their 10 steps and said, what works for New York State and works for what we're doing? And, um, you know, code of ethics, you know, you know, one thing for us, really, we really rely on is our reputation. Um, we are so aware of it, and you know, we do family follow-up surveys, so we're constantly getting feedback from our families to make sure we're aligned properly. Uh, I read them every day when they come in, and I really look at them, and I share them with our staff as a validation of their good deeds when you get those nice comments. And, um, but these procedures need to be in place so staff can be successful. Um, so a code of ethics... You know, by having this, these 10 steps, it holds not just Mike and I accountable, our employees accountable to a system. You know, we can all have a bad day. You know, if I didn't sleep well last night, or, you know, I had, I, once in a while you do keep in disagreement with your spouse, and you may, may lose sleep over it, and you come into work nasty in the morning, you need a system to pick you up on the bad days. You know, because we're not perfect people, we're all fallible. Um, to have 10 steps in place, these employees can never fail. So. The second one, um, personal identity, we make sure that when someone arrives in our funeral home, that they are tagged properly. We, um, we, they, they are brought to an area where all the supplies are provided. We even take a fingerprint. We slow our staff down to say, okay, they have to be checked in properly. Um, the next one, number three, is a unique tracking system. So I mentioned earlier that the crematorium has a little metal disc with a number on it when we arrive. 
we do the same thing here. I would suggest ours is way more important than theirs because it stays with the person. When we receive back the cremated remains, we know the crematory didn't mix up people. Or, so, and the family's involved with this process. You're not just blindly trusting us to assign a number and then tell you later. You see that number ahead of time. So that when you receive back your loved one, oh yeah, two, number 200 is in there. But I got back my loved one because I knew 200 was assigned to that person ahead of time. You need to be a part of the process. You don't need to me, let me do this on my own. You want to be involved. Um, transparency is huge and very important. Um, and I would suggest if a funeral home or a funeral provider isn't doing that much for you, then they don't, they're not aware of the issues. Um, because when we first started doing it, I'll be very honest. Mike and I, we had a system, but we didn't have the family place the medallion with the person. So they were trusting that we put the medallion on the right person. You're trusting me blindly. What if I put it on Mrs. Jones instead of Mr. Smith? Right? I mean, I, we, we, we have this saying here, we ask you to trust us by not trusting us. I mean, it's really that simple. The only way to know is to see, you know, to be a part of the process, you know. And sometimes, like Mike is saying, we don't know everybody that comes to our door. So we don't know the person. So how do we know the hospital gave us the right person? So if someone dies in a hospital, there's been situations where they placed the wrong identification tag on the person, how would we know that the hospital did that? Yeah? Yeah? I know it all too well. I've actually, I, I went to a creek, uh, the, the, in um, Genesee Hospital years ago, a friend of mine's grandmother was in the hospital. I go to pick someone up, Mrs. whatever, and the wall was, was her name. I'm like, I didn't hear she died. She hadn't died. She was sick, but she hadn't died. Her name was registered as if she was in that cooler. And I said, I called John. I said, John, what's going on? Well, she's fine. The hospital. The hospital, yeah. I'm like, so it, it can happen. Um, so what we do is we dress people. We give them dignity. You know, we, we want them to, to go to the crematory, even though it's in a container clothes. We want them to be, you know, we want a pillow under their head. We want them in clothing. We want them given dignity. Um, so... One of the things was we came up with that system of, okay, so this number four is about identity. So we said cremation is going to take place at a specific time. We're not going to arrive at a crematory and tell them, do it at your leisure. We're going to arrive at any time. It's going to commence at that time. We're going to witness the initiation of the cremation. But we backed it up. So we said, so for example, if the cremation is 2 p.m., we want you to come here at 1 p.m. in a room like this, hand a disc, to the, to the loved one, place it with them, see them. That person then doesn't go back downstairs into our holding area. That person goes from here into the hearse and goes to the crematory. Eliminates doing this, mixing people up. If I have a bad day, I can't move it up, can I? You said this is, this is my loved one. I put them in the hearse and I take them to the crematory. I can't make a mistake. So it eliminates human error. So that was, a, that was the most important thing we did with this whole system. And what we found was, when we ask people to come place that disc for Sega, and we call it now a goodbye, it's not a sterile identification. It's a goodbye opportunity to see your loved one one last time, to know in your mind, I placed a disc with them. The funeral home didn't harvest their body parts, thank God. Um, it's that they were, they were given the right person, and that from there, they went to the hearse and went to the crematory. Now, we invite people to come along if they want to. So that step was the one that surprised us. We knew all these other steps were going to be accepted, but the one where the people follow after that goodbye really shocked us. Yes, Joe? Yeah. Can I just add one thing? Um, real quick, when Dave mentioned that people have the option to go into the crematory, kind of have a couple of options within the parameters. Some people have elected to just follow us in the hearse, like they were going to the cemetery for the burial, and we've gotten to the gate and people had just left. They just felt like following to know that that was their dad or their spouse. They left here, went right to the crematory, so they actually followed us right there and you know, we got there. You have that second option of going inside. Uh, you even have an option of helping us inside the crematory if you want. Not, not all are important. You know, you gotta make a decision yourself, but following there, people have embraced that quite a bit, I found anyway. Mm -hmm. Just to be there. Okay. 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 
body doesn't have to be embalmed, right? No. So when we have them come, so this is what we do. Um, we still dress people. We, we bathe them. We comb their hair. We, we make them look presentable. And, and I have heard stories that some people have been to other funeral homes, and when they say goodbye like that, that it's a negative experience, we will not let that happen in this building. We will make sure that when you come say goodbye, we do whatever we can to make sure it's not a negative experience. Um, I had a situation like an accident where somebody wasn't viewable. We allowed the family to come in to see his tattoo of his ankle before he went to the crematory, and they knew it was him. So in that situation, they still were part of the process. Not the way it was the best, but it was still yes. an option. Something um, that gave them comfort. And, um, and, and they ended up growing, the younger person ended up growing from just immediate family. There was 25 people here okay. to say goodbye to, to his ankle. Literally, because they all knew it's my buddy, you know, and, and they wanted to be a part of the process. You know what? And they all walked out saying thank you and giving me a hug. So, you know, years ago we would never do this stuff, and we would think it was crazy. But as we do it, people are saying thank you for the opportunity to say goodbye. The feedback we're getting is so positive on this that we don't know any other way now. And then when Mike and I will present this to families with such passion now that they will say to us, you know what? Yeah, I get it. Even when they don't want to do it, someone will come. Even if it's one person to represent the family, that's, that's important. It may not be for everybody. You know, I'm the biggest sissy in the world. When my dog died, they said to me, hey, we've got to give her the last shot. Do you want to be there? I said, no. I'm out of here. I cried. I said, you know what? And I sent them a letter later saying, thank you. You were wonderful people. And, and I, I had to walk out. I couldn't stay. I had to get out of there. That's me. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Um, but... So the next step on here that talks about paperwork. So now once again, that medallion has a number. So we, we put it in our file so we can follow up with it. So I sign that I saw the, the 200 number. The family signs it. It's in our file. When we receive those cremated remains back, that's with the person. We know that they gave us back the wrong person and they didn't mix anybody up. It, it completely eliminates the chance for error. Um, and, and if you're not a part of that process, you're blindly trusting us to do it. And, and I would suggest somebody, even if it's a friend in the family, if you can't do it, somebody should be your advocate. Just your double set of eyes. Um, cremation logbook talks about that. You know, the mom hope is wonderful. Uh, when we get there, once again, they got their medallion, they got a logbook, they got paperwork. They give us a form showing their number system, so, it, so it's a duplicate effort. You know, where we have a number, they have a number, so you're really getting two medallions back. Hey, that's okay. You know, it's better to have too much fussing and cutting mm -hmm. corners. Um, and they're wonderful at what they do and, and they've done a great job. We're really, really happy with what they're doing. Um, so after the cremation, um, certainly um, there might be a service. Um, I have a service on Friday where we're bringing the person to a church. There's no calling hours here. We're having a memorial service at a church. Um, they're going to do a memorial gathering afterwards. So they've asked us to bring her back to the funeral home and they're going to come back on Saturday to receive her. Um, along with some anything left over personal items. So, so they're a little concerned about having to worry about what we do with her during our, our gathering time where they're going to have coffee and cookies and things like that. They said, please take her home for us and we'll come and get her the following day. So we're very careful about that handoff too, you know. Um, someone's just not just sitting in a car somewhere or, you know. <laughs> we're very careful about, you know, the custody of the, of the, the urn and the person. Um, so that being said, you know, sometimes Church services then are followed by a cemetery. So that's something we're doing. Actually, Friday, we have two services Friday. So the other service is cremation. Go into a Catholic church because you have to <laughs> listen to the priest. Bring in the cremated remains in the church. And then we're going to the Holy Sepulchre Cemetery, like you saw before, um, for a columbarium burial on Friday. So many ways of doing that. Um, but the thing is, whoever you're choosing, they have to have a system. You know, don't just... That you'll see them advertised all over town now. They're cropping up all over the place. I call them direct disposers. All they do is just bare function. They don't take the time to worry about this stuff. You know, our basic cremation fee isn't that much more money. Is it worth taking a chance with somebody who's lowest cost? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, to me, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> but <laughs> Can I ask this question? Sure. Um, is there um, any families that when they're seeing the viewing at that time when the cremation is supposed to be happening, 
right then and there they're, they're saying no, we don't want the cremation done. Once. We 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 had Once. a family yeah. family members that didn't come. You got to get here because they wanted to have a viewing now because they couldn't believe how good the person looked. Yeah. Shocked and said, "You've got to come." Yeah. Because they never expected the person to look that way. Because we took those extra steps. Mm -hmm. um, because once again, we don't want it to be a negative experience. Um, we don't even charge for the, the, getting the person prepared properly. It's not embalming, but it's still you know it could be cosmetic. It could be just doing the hair properly. Whatever it is to make them look right, um, we just think it's that important, you know, to do it that way. We've learned. Once again, we learned throughout this process, you know, as we created these steps, you know, we learned a lot. You know, interesting thing of this too, everybody, 30 years ago when I started, if you had told me that we were going to have a, a farewell where somebody comes in, an unembalmed body, or we're going to place a medallion with it, I had told you you were crazy. Matter of fact, after all those things had happened, and Dave and I sat down, like he said, you know, that local, those local funeral homes that had did some things that weren't so great, we knew we needed to because people were worried. You know, your imagination is always worse than our reality. Even if your imagination is wrong, you're going to believe your imagination, right? Well, when we first brought this to our dad's attention, saying, hey, we're going to start doing this. I want to say, well, I won't use the words that he used. Um, <laughs> he was less than pleased with our effort. And he said a few choice words, and he stormed out and said, you guys are nuts. I won't tell you all the other things, but to Dave's point, you know, we're always open to, I guess, one of the, being with a provider who's always open to learning, which we are. Um, I, we weren't doing this 30 years ago. Um, and we realized that we needed to. Uh, so the right provider is always looking at, well, this is what I did today, but how am I going to do it better tomorrow? And that's a philosophy. That, that's not something you put in a pamphlet. It's not something you put on a website. It's not a, you know, a little quirky you know, tagline you can put in an ad. It's, it's really a culture. And, and that's, I think that's the big difference here. The way we're doing it now probably is going to change again. <laughs> it's probably isn't the end, but it, it'll never be worse than it is today. Whatever we're doing today, it's just going to get better. So almost done with you. The next thing is, so you learned a lot from the seminar today. What's next? What do you do? Um, once again, I, I think you got to go home and communicate with your family. Um, talk about, I mean, whether it's cremation, burial, whatever you're doing, you need to talk to your family. Let them all adjust it, come together. If there is a difference, try to come to middle ground. Um, oops, I did it again, didn't I? So come to middle ground um, and have that meeting. Communicate. Talk about all these things, the finances, the, the requests, the, you know, Tell them something simple like, I want this song for a funeral. You know, let people know what you're thinking. Don't keep it inside because no one's going to know. That last one I always talk about is avoid procrastination. So in your folder is that, is that handout here. Some of you were here last time and you already have this. But what it is is it takes you through, you know, what should I be doing? You know, what's next? So go through these things with your family. Talk about some of your preferences. You know, and also cataloging some of your memories and things that made you special, you know. Whether that's placing an obituary on our website so it perpetually recorded what you were all about, uh, which is kind of nice to know. Um, or if it's just things that the family can hand on down to one another. Um, it's so very important to, to kind of get this in black and white. You know, and, and start planning. And then uh, once, once again, to kind of summarize here today, um, Cremation provider, be careful who you're using. Make sure they have a system. At the very least, they should have a system. Um, so be careful there. Um, and if you want to sit down with us and talk about the next step, talk with your family. Some of you have already pre planned with us. But come meet with us and get the stuff from the family and on a paper to here so that, so that there's none of this connect. And, that, you know, and you can discuss all the options and have them down. Um, makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to open up for questions before we have lunch. Anything that we haven't talked about yet? I know you guys asked a lot of questions so far. Are there any more on the top of your mind? Well done. Well done. Yeah. Okay. So lunch is, once again, by Dell. So we got a question. You mentioned bodies of water as far as scattering. Are we talking laws against it? There are, yes. Which, don't share this. <laughs> when, we <laughs> first moved, when we first yeah, moved here, sure this does not leave this room. Here. When we first moved here, we were scattering cremains in the creek, yep. which is right over here. Mike and I thought it was nice. 
then we found out we were breaking the law if we stopped doing it. <laughs> um, so we won't break the law any longer. And that was for families that wanted us to. We didn't just randomly see the street lights. <laughs> hey, we didn't know where to put them. You have a nice place. <laughs> we're like, oops. <laughs> Um, the, the law the law says about scattering cremains in New York State, no, by the way, anybody that can identify what this means, if you can tell us what it means, you will get a free funeral. Uh, so the law says you are allowed to scatter cremated remains. This is different than a body of water. You're allowed to scatter them so long as in doing so it does not create a public nuisance. <laughs> so there will be no free funerals today. Um, <laughs> It's very, very ambiguous. So I suppose if I witness you scattering your cremains in your backyard, that's a nuisance. And if I complain to somebody, I guess it could become an issue. But the law is written so poorly, uh, and that law is probably older than I am, and it's a law that just really needs to go away. I can't do it on the carousel. I agree, I mean, out there. I always use the, the kiss but don't tell more method. <laughs> what we don't know, we can't regulate. <laughs> So long as it didn't create a public what? Nuisance. What if people in the service and they get their ashes um, thrown out on uh, the Atlantic Ocean or something like that? Um, and if, when the service happens, bodies come back home. So yeah. if they have the body, the burial at sea is a, was a rarity. Not, not the ashes. Yep. Yeah, even even home. that body's going to come back home. You can get it done. I, I, there was the guy. Um, but you was talking York. about through the service. Yeah, but it was, I think it can be done, but you got to get. There's certain steps you got to take to be oh, okay. officially able to do it. You can't just go do it. Oh, okay. if mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm not sure exactly how it works. There's a guy in New York City we've talked to that can do it. If we have any other requests, we can send mm -hmm. someone down there. And yeah. Is it for disease reasons? And, um, no, I mean, you think about the heat. You know, you're not going to have anything left after that kind of heat. It, it, it kind of sanitizes you. So there's not a